I'm Agnes Isaacs, and we are Zooming from Glasgow today. We are delighted to have Miriam Margolis, an extremely famous actress, as our guest speaker today. Miriam is joining us from Italy in Tuscany. She has appeared in many television, film, and theater productions during her long and varied career. We look forward to hearing from you, Miriam, about your exciting career. Miriam, is it right to say that you are part Scottish? You're dead right I am, dear. My father, God rest his soul, Joseph Margulies, and by the way, it's pronounced Margulies, not Margolis. Margolis was Harry Margolis, the band leader in Glasgow. I knew him too. <laughs> right, well, uh, my father was born in 1899, and he died aged 96 in 1950. 1965. No, 19, 1995. That's right, 1995. And uh, I heard Scottish voices from when I was wee, you know. So for me, Scotland is, is the best part of England. That's my answer. Do you want any more? Yes, tell us more about your, 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 your Scottish heritage and... Well, um, I've been looking into my family tree, which is something I strongly urge everybody to do. And if you've got grandchildren, as some of you must have, I do not, but some of you must have, get your grandkids to do research and find out about your family. It is so interesting. My great-grandfather on my father's side came from Belarus, which at that time was just Russia. And they came from a little shtetl called Amdur, which is about 18 miles, I think, southwest of Grodno. Grodno Gaberni the province of Grodno. I've been there twice. There are no Jews left there now. They were all murdered in the Holocaust in 1941, which was the year that I was born. So the history of the Holocaust and my history are completely intertwined. I didn't know that when I was growing up in Oxford, which is where I was born. But the whole of my life actually has been colored and informed by the Holocaust. And for me, it is the central fact of my life other than my own birth, because it had such a huge, powerful shadow over all the people that I knew and loved. Did I lose any family in the Holocaust? I did, but I didn't know that until I was quite grown up. When I was doing my research, in fact, I discovered that cousins of my father who lived in Grodno and Bialystok had been put on the trains to Treblinka, which was the other horrifying extermination camp in Poland. And so I realized that even though I didn't know it, the pull of the Holocaust was deeply upon me. And it still is, it still is. In, in Scotland, my, my Belarusian grand, grandfather, great-grandfather actually, was called Simon Margolis, Margolius, as they call it in Scotland. I call it Margolies. And they got off the boat at Leith because they thought it was New York. Very common story. We all know that story. They got off the boat and, you know, they, they liked Scotland, so they stayed. My grandfather was a peddler he would go about the lowland villages of Scotland with a pack on his back of little gems, little 
tchotchkes, which he would sell to the miners' wives. And he was a pleasant, honest, kindly individual, very nice man. I never knew him. He died in 1937 before I was born. But he made friends with all his customers and he did well. They were very, very poor when they arrived. In fact, my father uh, suffered from rickets as a child and rickets is a disease of malnutrition and he always had bow legs. I remember that very distinctly. And when I asked him why, he said, because I had rickets as a child. They lived in the Gorbals. Um, I can't remember the street, but anyway, they lived there. And eventually my grandfather made enough money to buy his own shop. And he bought a jewelry shop in St. Enoch Square called James McMenamin. I always called it James McMurgoyus because it, McMenamin is not a Jewish name. That was the previous owner. And he, he lived there and um, lived in Glasgow and, and brought up his family. Daddy was the ducks of Hutchie Grammar School. And eventually he went to university, came down to London after doing a stint as a ship surgeon on the Paddy Henderson line, which went between Glasgow and Rangoon in Burma. And then he met my mother at a Jewish tennis club. I don't know what Jewish tennis is like, but <laughs> that's where they met. And then I was born in 1941. They were bombed out of their house in London and came to Oxford because they were told that Oxford would never be bombed. And that it was true, it never was bombed because Hitler wanted Oxford to be his capital because it was a beautiful city. And that's why it was never bombed. My Scottish connections are all through my father. He always had um, a dram on, a, on Shabbos, after the lights went down, you know, after, after the stars came out, and he always had a cigar on Shabbos. He would light it after the, the, the stars were out. And um, he had a very Scottish accent, which I love. I love hearing Scottish sounds. And he would always, um, he loved the bagpipes. And when my cousin uh, Jennifer Bach got married at Garnet Hill they had a piper outside the shul nice. <laughs> so next question from you Agnes I'm not going to hey. keep talking unless you prompt me because I don't know the sort of things people want to know that, that's, we, we definitely wanted to hear your, your Scottish connections you must have felt oh, quite Wait a second. Are you all in Scotland, all the people that are listening to me? No, no, no. We have members from all over the country. Oh, I see. From no. all over the country. I am based in Glasgow and a few other, a few a few people here today are as well. Um, well I, want to, I want to say just that I remember my uh, my caterer, Mrs. Mrs. Lipsy. Of Do course, yes. Lipsy? Oh, what a great caterer she was. Um, she went to Canada and she died in Canada with her family, but she was a wonderful caterer. And I remember also Mrs. Bach, who kept a shop in Allen's Allison Street in the Gorbals. And that's where I used to go when I was at school holidays and we used to go and get, oh, you know, all the lovely kosher food there. Yes, um, yes. And, uh, she, it was a kind of a delicatessen and, and a shop. I loved it. So and those are the... Those are the names that I remember. And of course, Janine's. Oh, yes. I, I was told a few years ago that Janine had closed and that there wasn't a single kosher restaurant in Glasgow left. Is that We true? have. We, we have. You have? Well, I bet they're not as good as Janine's were. No. I love Janine's. 
<laughs> that was just a few years ago. A, a long time. Well, I'm 79. So you can imagine it was a long time ago. Yes. Mrs. Slipsy catered my wedding, by the way. <laughs> now, you, when you said that just now, you said wedding. That tells me that you were born somewhere else. Where were you born? I was born in Hungary, in Budapest. I know it well. I've made three films there. Wonderful. Wonderful. What, films, what films did you make in Budapest? I made a film called Sunshine, which is actually my favorite film. It's a Jewish, it's a Jewish subject about a Jewish family called Sonnenschein, who um, it, it's about three generations of that family with um, Ray Fiennes playing the lead in all three generations. I was the first mother. Rachel Weiss was in it. Um, and uh, it was, a wonderful experience, and I, I love being there. I'm sorry to say that anti-Semitism is quite strong now in Hungary. I don't know if you knew that. Yes. The, the government there is not a, not a good one. Not a good no. one. No. And Maybe the other ones I made, um, I made one called Being Julia with um, Warren Beatty's wife, Annette Benning. And that was great fun too and what i loved was the market in budapest because i love shopping i love markets but i like a metzia i want something <laughs> i want something that's not expensive so i like going to markets and i can tell you that at one time budapest market was the best market in the world it really was and i bought a great deal of stuff from there i really loved it it's still very good <laughs> Is it still very good? Okay. It's still very good, yes. Um, I wish one of you lot would make me some latkes. Here I am in, <laughs> it's Hanukkah, and, and I'm in Tuscany, and I haven't had a latke, <laughs> not, not for ages. So uh, I just have to put up with it. We'll try and send you some if we can, <laughs> Miriam. <laughs> Miriam, you played Queenie in Jack Ronda's The Lost Tribe, the 1980s miniseries. Now, you must have felt quite at home having heard your story. How did you end up doing that um, series? Well, it, it was a wonderful experience. Jack Ronda, the writer, uh, was Jewish and lived in, in Glasgow. And he, he wrote it and he wrote a part for me and I was thrilled to be able to do it. It was about a Jewish family growing up in, in, now were they in Edinburgh, I think? Were they growing up in Edinburgh or Glasgow? I can't quite remember. My husband was played by Billy Patterson. And no, my father was played by Billy Patterson and he's younger than me, but he was playing my father. And we went, one episode was on location uh, when the family went on holiday and we were put up in uh, it was in um, uh, Elgin near Elgin in the northeast and we were put up in a little woody cottage and B Bill and I absolutely fell in love with that place and we bought it <laughs> from the Earl of Seafield who was the owner at that time and he's the He's the biggest landowner in the British Isles, the Earl of Seafield. I didn't know that. And we bought it for £5,000, incredibly cheaply. And we did it up and had it for some time as a holiday place. And I've become quite fond of the Northeast. I never thought I would, but it's a beautiful area. And it, it's near Port Soy, which is a lovely little seaside town. So if you're looking for somewhere different to go for a holiday, think about that. Okay. Um, you were in the lead in the one. In what? You were in the lady in the van. Oh, the lady in the van. <laughs> and you were better than Maggie oh, Smith, yeah. I've heard. You, you, you've got lots of Vs to have to cope with. <laughs> <laughs> I was the lady in the van, yes. I did it in, um, th that's a play uh, written by Alan Bennett, uh, which Maggie Smith, Dame Maggie Smith played in London with great acclaim. 
and I played it with just as much acclaim in Melbourne, in Australia, because I've really fallen in love with Australia and I have a house and a career there. And they asked me to do that show. And that was last, um, yeah, last year I did it. It was absolutely exhausting, great fun, but climbing in and out of that ruddy van, it was, it was exhausting. I heard you were better than Maggie Smith. Well, I probably said that, but I don't, I don't know if anybody else did. <laughs> I, I actually read it somewhere, so it must be true. Oh, well, that's very, very heartening. I, I don't think anybody could be better than her. I was probably different because every actress brings something of themselves to every role. And I brought what I can bring and I did, I did my best, but it was a wonderful part. And the, and the great excitement for me was meeting um, Alan Bennett um, going to see him because I thought I'd better check with him that it was all right for me to play it because I look so different uh, from the real Miss Shepherd, who was a kind of a weird old bag who who um, I don't know how to describe her really she was probably mentally affected and she was poor and lived in a in a in a van she just lived in the van slept in the van, washed in the van. And um, I, she was very tall and slender and nobody could ever say that I was tall and slender. So I thought I'd better check <laughs> that Alan Bennett thought it was okay. And he said, oh yes, yes, that's fine. Don't worry, you look, you look the part inside, he said. So that, that was, that was You okay. look perfect in the role. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you also played Mildred in Calls the Midwife. Would you consider going back to that again? Oh, I am going back. Yes, uh, I definitely. Um, I'm the I'm the mother superior. I'm Mother Mildred. I started off as Sister Mildred, and then I became Mother Mildred. It's kind of weird when you're Jewish, you know, to play a a very devout nun. But um, it's an Anglican order, not a Catholic order, um, and in some ways. The Catholic Church has more affinity with the Jewish Church because it loves drama. It's full of ritual and performance, uh, which uh, we love in our in our religion. We have fantastic set pieces. I always find it incredibly moving when the Torah is taken around the congregation and everybody cranes forward and the men put their talus onto it and to, to kiss it. I, I find that very moving. Now, I'm not a believer, but I still think that the, the power of that book for us as a community is extraordinary. And it is a very moving thing to see. And of course, the lighting of the candles, the Shabbos candles, um, that's a moving thing too. I don't, but even though I don't believe, I still, um, fast on Yom Kippur, I always have. And I keep Pesach as well. Um, but when I fast on Yom Kippur and I go to shul wherever I am in the world, um, I always think what an extraordinary thing on Kol Nidre that all over the world, Jewish people are celebrating a very holy moment in the year because of what it's it's one ceremony that people do try to get to whatever whatever their beliefs and however busy they are and um and I do it myself even though I don't believe in it I still feel I want to be connected to my people and when I'm in shul I am is there a shul near you in Tuscany Oh, no. <laughs> no, no shoes in Tuscany. Oh, there are. I mean, there's a very, there's a very famous, beautiful shul in Siena and in Florence. Um, and I've been to both of them. And there's a wonderful shul in Rome, which is not in Tuscany. But Siena and Florence are in Tuscany. It's just um, at the moment, you know, there are, there are no meetings of any kind because just like in England, we're all in lockdown. 
we can't we can't go to other places and we mustn't we have to keep the rules in order to protect the community do you spend a lot of time in tuscany or where do you consider where is your home now it's a very difficult question to answer my home is where i am i think wherever i hang my hat is my home and that may be quite a, a a jewish experience because we are a wandering nation we've had to be um but i love i love the houses i have i you know when you don't have children you have money to buy houses children are expensive i don't have children so what I've done with my money is buy houses. So I have a house in Tuscany, this one, which was very inexpensive when I bought it in 1973. I have a house in London. I have a house by the sea in St. Margaret's Bay. And I have a house in Australia. So I think home is where I am. And... Um, I love all my houses. People say, why don't you sell some? No, you don't sell your children, do you? Okay, so with all this COVID around, we are all in need of a bit of magic. Can you tell us what it was like on the set of Harry Potter at Hogwarts as Professor Sprout, who had to deal with the pesky mandrakes? Yes, well, it was very lucky for me to get that part. Uh, it's probably the thing that I'll be best known for, I suppose. Um, although it, for me, it wasn't a very interesting part. It was something I could do standing on my head. You know, it's not a, a great acting role. But it was uh, impressive to be part of such a vibrant uh, series on film. It, it was um, an important series. And I'm very pleased and grateful that I got a, a part in it. I only was in two of the films. I should have been in all of them, but um, they didn't put me in all of them. Although Professor Sprout is throughout in all the books, but I guess they didn't feel that it was necessary to put me in. So I didn't, I only had two, two films, but they were good and I enjoyed it. I liked being part of a great circus, which is what it was. I'm not someone who really admires fantasy. I'm, I'm not into fantasy. I'm into reality. I think we, we have the moment that we're in and that's the moment that we have to make work for us and make it the best that we can. Fantasy doesn't interest me. So although Many people are huge fans of Harry Potter. I'm not a particular Harry Potter fan. I like the people. And I think the books are extremely well written. I think she's a wonderful writer. And I love the fact that the richest woman in England is a writer, not a businessman. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, you, of course, won a, a BAFTA. Well, I don't know about, of course. I mean, yes, I did win a BAFTA. I won Best Supporting Actress for The Age of Innocence, directed by Martin Scorsese, with Michelle Pfeiffer, Dan Day-Lewis, and Winona Ryder as the other stars. I never expected to win any awards. I was terrified when I went to the interview. Martin Scorsese is a, a very important American director, hugely gifted, really Hollywood royalty. And I can remember going for the interview to his New York apartment. Uh, well, it, not apartment, a house. I mean, he had a huge house. And I was absolutely terrified. I was shown in by, the, by his uh, maid and told to wait in, in the library. And his library is not just of books. He's got a library of films of all the films practically that were ever made, thousands and thousands. So I was looking at that with some interest. And this small, intense man came into the room 
and put out his hand to shake mine. And I was just immediately enchanted. He was charming, but not charming in a phony way. He was charming because he wanted connection. He wanted to explain to me why he wanted to do this film, what my part would be. And I was, I, I forgot my nerves. I forgot that I was terrified. And I just chatted away quite happily. And I got the part and then I won the BAFTA. So it was a very happy experience. And I loved Michelle Pfeiffer. I didn't like Winona Ryder at all. We, we didn't get on. I liked Dan Day-Lewis, who by the way is Jewish. His mother was Jill Balkan, daughter of Sir Michael Balkan, who was the great English film producer from Hungarian background, I think. Oh, oh I didn't know that. There was Geraldine Chaplin in that film as well. Yes, she was. What a very nice woman. Her mother was Una, Una O'Neill, um, who's the daughter of Eugene O'Neill, the great American writer. And her grandfather was Charlie Chaplin. So um, what a heritage to come from. But she's charming. She's just so much fun and so natural and relaxed and that's what people should be like you know I, i've met some stars who are really up themselves and i don't i'm not interested because i think that what matters is human connection how you could how you are able to to absolutely connect with someone one of the problems of doing this zoom is that i have to look into that little camera at the top of my computer Whereas what I want to do is to look at you down there. But if I do that, I lose connection with you out there. So I have to sort of alternate between the two. What role would you like to play that you haven't played yet? I want to play a part called Mary Tyrone in Long Day's Journey Into Night by Eugene O'Neill. Funnily enough, we were just mentioning his granddaughter. Um, I, I want, I played it before. I played it when I was at university. It's a, a very tragic part. And I know people think of me as a, as a comedian. I'm not, I'm not at all. I like sad, serious parts. And it is a sad, serious part of the story of, of, a, of the disintegration of a family, of the betrayals that happen between husband and wife and mother and children. And it is very, very sad, but it's so powerful. And in fact, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me happened to me because of that tragedy. It was the opening in Cambridge, it was when I was a student, I, I played it. And on the first night, in the interval, the technicians had been very busy working up the smoke from the smoke machines because the second act opens onto a foggy night. Well, they'd worked so hard that when the curtain went up, the fog took over the entire theater. There was one other person on the stage besides me. I couldn't see her and she couldn't see me. And the audience couldn't see us. And my first line was, the fog is thick tonight, Kathleen. <laughs> and by golly, it was. Right. Um, you, you have got an OBE from the Queen. <laughs> I have got an OBE from the Queen, and I very much like the surprise in your voice when you said that. <laughs> Sorry? I said I liked the surprise in your voice when you said that. You've got an OBE from the Queen, you said. Well, nobody could have been as surprised as I was when I received the information that I was going to be awarded that honour. And when you get told, you 
you do have the opportunity to refuse it if you wish. And many people think that I should have refused it because of my uh, socialist attitudes. They said, you know, how can you be a socialist and get an award from the Queen? And I thought, well, you know, they're right, of course, it's very inconsistent, but never mind, I want it. So I accepted it with gratitude and great surprise. I got it for services to drama. And um, I'm very pleased with it. It was a great day. We went down to the palace. Now, my great sadness, of course, was that my parents were not alive to be there, to come with me to the palace to see it. That would have given them, you know that word, nachas? It would have given them nachas. Nachas, indeed. To yes. degree, it would have. However, um, I asked one of my cousins, Penelope Torrance, the name originally was Turiansky, and they were a family from Edinburgh, the Turiansky family. And she, she, was a, she was and is a dear friend. And so I asked her to represent my father's side of the family and to represent my mother's side of the family. I asked our au pair girl, because when I left uh, to go and be a student, mummy had a, a girl from Italy come and live with her to you know, help with the house. And we had this wonderful young woman Francesca Franco from Vercelli in Italy, who is still one of my closest friends. And I thought it would be a wonderful way of commemorating my mother because they were very close. So I asked her, so those two came with me. And um, it was a very lovely day. I mean, it's a bit scary. I didn't have the queen giving them out because she was in mourning for her mother's death. So it was Prince Charles who gave me my honor. And I love him. I just love him. He's a sweetheart. And he was so friendly and welcoming to me. And he said, oh, Miriam, I'm so, so delighted to give you this honor. Lovely. Well done. You know, he was, he was just wonderful. So I had a great time. Do you think Prince Charles is well portrayed in the crown? No, because you met him, so you can tell us. I won't watch it. Oh. I won't watch The Crown because I saw a, a trailer and I thought it was so bad <laughs> that I simply couldn't watch it. It was um, a very good actress, Gillian Anderson, being Mrs Thatcher. And I thought it was so over the top, so unsubtle. I, I didn't want to watch it. And I've heard, I, other people have told me that the uh, attitude towards Prince Charles is not, not friendly, it's not a good one. He comes out of it badly. And I thought, well, I don't want, I don't want to watch it. You know, I'm a, if I'm a friend of somebody, if I believe in them, I'm not going to hear rubbish about them. I'm not going to stand around and look at something because the crown is simply entertainment. It's a soap opera. It's not history. It's not truth. It's one man's depiction of something that he knows nothing about. He doesn't know what it was like to be there, to say the words. So I'm afraid I'm not watching it. So whether it's good about Prince Charles or bad, I can't tell you. You have okay. to make your own mind. I just thought I would ask you. I should probably should have asked you at the very beginning, when did you know that you wanted to be an actress? Well, I always knew that I loved acting and acting in a way is just showing off and I love showing off. I just adored seeing people look at me and laugh. Making people laugh is a is a gorgeous feeling. And I, I knew that I had that gift to make people laugh. I don't know why, it's just something I was born with. Um, 
but I didn't really know that there was a, a way you could earn a living doing that. that. That was news to me. I was surprised. So I think it was when I was at Cambridge, when I, I went to Cambridge University after school, where there are many opportunities to act with lots of different societies. And I did, in the three years of my Cambridge career, I did three, I, I, did, I did 20 performances and uh, 20 different productions. And I think after that, I knew if I could possibly earn a living, that was the thing, as it still is, because it's a very precarious profession. My father always used to ask me every year, what is your income? And um, when I would tell him, he would go, oh dear, oh dear. And then one year I told him my income and he went, oh, really? That was a good moment. <laughs> he was happy then. Yes. <laughs> All of us will have seen you in the real Marigold Hotel. Can you tell us about your adventures on the Marigold Hotel? It was a very um, surprising offer that came out of the blue. Uh, eight old people were going to be put together in Jaipur in Italy, uh, in India. I wish it had been in Italy in some ways. Uh, in India, and to find out whether the, we would like to retire them. Well, I'd been to India twice before, and I love India, absolutely love it. But I didn't really know any of the people that I was going to be put with. And that, of course, is fascinating, because if you're going on holiday or traveling with people, you sort of want to know who they are and what they're like, because you're in really close proximity. They put us in a really nice, what I would call a boutique hotel, very small, not, not many rooms, but very typical of the Indian aristocracy because the family that owned the hotel were related to the Maharaja of Jaipur. And they were charming people, absolutely beautiful manners, beautiful welcome, lovely rooms, quite simple, not, not luxurious. And the, the point of the program was to see whether we would retire to India. Well, I don't think anybody would wanted to actually retire there because part of what you want when you retire is to be with the people that you know, uh, certainly in my case, but I wouldn't mind living there six months of the year. I can say that honestly, because it's a beautiful country with gorgeous people. And um, I had a wonderful time. I mean, the shopping, the shopping, oi, the shopping, shopping. it's wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. This, this ring that I have now, let me see. Can you see that? It's, um, it's lapis lazuli. And I think I paid 30 quid for it. But it's really lovely. Have another look at that. Um, Very nice. It is. I love it. No, and the people were so nice. And in you know, some I got on with better than others. No surprise, because that's like life. But I loved Bobby George. We are still friends. Uh, the, the man who plays the darts. He's a, what my mother would have called a rough diamond. He would say, oh, I've got to talk, I've got to teach you how to talk, man. You talk all posh like that, you know. You don't want to talk like that. You want to talk like me, like a real person. He's adorable. And, no, they really all were very nice. I mean, we all got on, sometimes better than others. What's happened to Peter Brent? He's gone, has he gone for a wee? Oh, he's still there. <laughs> you're allowed to go you know you don't have to stay it's okay <laughs> okay next question agnes i've had lots of questions through chat okay i was going to ask you so uh, can you ask what these questions through chat? Okay. susan here i'm not taking over agnes's wonderful 
event with Miriam, but uh, I'm just going to ask, I've, I've had a few comments, so I'm going to read them. You're very popular with our audience, Miriam. Uh, so well, if, um, thank you. I'm very pleased and relieved. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to send you a copy of the chat. It's, uh, it's like fan mail. Um, I've had a, a comment. Um, We've never forgotten your Dickens women, which apparently was on Sky Arts. And amongst other parts of your performance, we'll treasure the memory of your double act as Mr. Bumble and Mrs. Corley. So that's from one of our I'm, members. I'm very really thrilled you should remember that. One of the things that's been really important in my life is my relationship with Charles Dickens. And I absolutely adore his writing and his vision of the world and his depiction of 19th century England. It's just brilliant. And he can write sad things and funny things. And I had the idea with Sonia Fraser, who's a, another actress since dead, unfortunately, but she and I wrote together this, this sort of piece for the, for the theatre. And I've taken it all over the world and it's been very popular. And I really have enjoyed it. And one of the highlights was when I took both parts of, 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 in this scene in which Mr. Bumble um, uh, uh, proposes to Mrs. Corney. And it, it really was so exciting and fun to invent this moment in, in, a, in a theatrical way, take it off the page. And I, I must say it was very good. I, I was quite proud of myself. Oh, I well, it. apparently it was on Sky Arts. We've had... Um somebody who's telling us that they lived in Gloucester Crescent and used to walk past Miss Shepherd's van every day. Wow. And, um, Did they and, know that she was smelly? Um, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let them answer that, see whether we get another comment. Um, I've got, very interesting, I've got Cheryl Lee on here. Hi, Cheryl. And she was a script supervisor in Romania. And she said, on your day off, you went shopping and you interviewed the cab driver and he was too nervous to be late to pick you up from the shopping mall. So Cheryl is one of our lovely volunteers at AJR. So uh, she asked us to send and say hi to you. Oh, I'm thrilled, darling. Thank you for, for that. Was that, when I was in Romania, that, was that, um, was that Modigliani? Yes, that Modigliani? yes, yes, it was. Uh, painter, yes. Yeah. Um, oh, that was fascinating, actually. I mean, I knew nothing about Romania, um, which is where a lot of Jewish people came from and were refugees from. But it, it was shortly after the awful dictator, Ceausescu, had, had been um, killed by, by the people. They, they turfed him out and killed him. And I, I was very pleased they did it because he was a very nasty man. He was somebody who told parents of um, disabled children that they should leave them with um, in homes where they were manacled and and bound up in the most hor horrible, tortured way. Never, never forgive him for that. Well, anyway, he got his comeuppance. But um, Romania was wonderful. Good. How hard was I? Will with regard to Call the Midwife. First of all, everybody wants to know when the new series will be out on our screens. Um, how hard was it to play the part of a nun, sort of bearing in mind your, you know, your Jewish heritage and your background, or, or was it just an acting part to you? Well, really, it is just acting. You know, every role you take, you can't, you can't have to say, well, I'm only going to take a role playing Jewish people or left-handed people, because I'm left-handed. You know, you, you, you have to go with the flow. And um, I know what, what belief is about, and I know what kindness is about, compassion. And they're two of the qualities of sister, of mother Mildred. So I was playing a human being. I wasn't playing a non-Jew. That doesn't enter into my head when I have to get inside the head of the character that I'm playing. I didn't know instinctively very much about, for instance, crossing myself. I had to be taught how to how you cross yourself because <laughs> who knew? You know, that's not part of our stuff. 
um, but I, I think that every part is an opportunity to discover what it's like to be inside another human being's mind. And that's how I see it. And did you attend drama school and do you support young drama students? I never went to drama school because I did all my so-called training when I was a, a university student at Cambridge. And by the time I left Cambridge, I was 22. So I didn't want to have to start being a student all over again. I don't think it's necessary to go to drama school to be an actor because it's something that's inside you. Drama school can, can certainly guide you and mold you, but it also can be dangerous because it can turn people very, it can turn out too many people the same because they're all taught the same method. And I found my own way of doing things. But I do support drama students, um, both um, financially on occasion and with advice. You know, sometimes they just ring me up or write an email and say, how do I do this? Or can you advise me about that? And I think that every older person's duty is to try to help a younger person. It was us once, we were young once, we needed a helping hand. And if you can give someone a helping hand, then do it. Um, I've had a few comments from people who were born in, in Prague, a couple of people who came obviously with Nicholas Winton um, as yeah. the Winton's children. Um, and a lot of comments about Budapest Market that everybody should go there. So uh, that comes back to the shopping um, again. A lot of people in agreement with you about The Crown. Um, yeah. I mean, you can still watch it, you know, it doesn't mean, yeah. you just have to remember, it's a soap opera, it's not the truth. I, I have to say, and I know a lot of people in our audience will agree, um, Prince Charles has always been very sympathetic to the kinder transport and AJR are very privileged. We have worked with, um, with the palace a few times. And in fact, he hosted a lunch for Kinder two years ago, which I'm sure I can't look across the whole screen because we've got an audience of well over a hundred now, but I know there's a lot of people on the screens who came to um, lunch at St. James's Palace and met Prince Charles. And I know they would very much agree with you. Um, wanted to... The next question is, what made you do your drive around Australia? Did you do a drive around yes. Australia? Well, uh, I was offered a series um, about Australia, um, which I was thrilled to be able to, to do, to accept. Um, my partner, who is a woman, is Australian. And I've only really seen the big cities in Australia. I didn't know the outlying areas at all. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me to get to know the country. And as I've got older, I've been offered more and more documentary programs rather than acting programs. And I very much enjoy it because I get to meet real people, proper people. Also, I don't have to learn lines, which is a great relief because I'm not good at that. Um, so I was thrilled to be able to, to do this and um, it was a very moving experience. It's a fascinating country. And um, I have a home there. So, you know, that it, it means a lot to me. A um, couple of other questions which are a little bit related. Um, first of all, anything in the pipeline? And is there a particular documentary you'd like to work on? Do you, is there something you'd like to report back on or? <laughs> yes, there is. And I'm not going to talk very much about it, but I would love to do a documentary about Israel and Palestine. Okay. That's well, I would love to do. But okay. At the moment, it's not possible. At the moment, it's not possible. Um, documentaries are interesting because I've got um, a really genuinely inquiring mind. I'm fascinated by people. I want to know why they think the way they do. What has life done to them to make them see the world in those terms? 
sometimes very similar to me and sometimes completely different. And you think, how can people think that differently from me? That's been very sharply etched for me by Brexit because I'm a Remainer, a complete Remainer. And I could never understand why people wanted to leave Europe. I just couldn't, I can't get inside their heads to see it, but there it is. People are very different. And if we're going to live in the world, we have to understand people who are different from us. We've got to, we've got to give them a chance. We've got to try to, to know who, who they are and why they are as they are. And um, that's why documentaries are so interesting to me. And I've been offered some more documentaries, um, one in Australia and one in England. I'm doing a lot of recording at the moment. Even here in Tuscany, I've got a funny little studio in the back stable, which is a sort of um, duvet suspended on curtain rails all from Ikea, because they've got Ikea in, in Tuscany, believe it or not. And um, I, I brought all the equipment out with me. So I'm, I'm recording, I've done a podcast for Audible, interviewing six old people who are doing extraordinary things. And that was fascinating. And that was all voice work. And I started in radio, so I'm probably going to finish in radio too, it looks like. The voice is a very important area of work for me. And um, I think that there's going to be a call the midwife at Christmas. I'm not in this Christmas episode because I was too frightened to film it during COVID. I'm uh, at risk, I have asthma, and I, I'm 78, no, 79 I am now. So I just didn't want to risk it. And I said, no, I'm not doing it, I'm sorry. So I'm, the next thing I'll be in will be Call the Midwife in April. By then, please God, I hope things will be more under control. Um, I've been asked why you chose to to stay in Tuscany during the COVID crisis. Obviously, you chose to isolate there. And do you speak Italian? I do speak Italian. I'm still learning Italian, but I mean, I'm not fluent, but I can get around. I can I can have a, a, a conversation in Italian. I can read Italian. But um, I wanted to get away from, from England. I, I have to say, I'm absolutely pissed off with England, pissed off with the government, pissed off with COVID. I, I just think it's become a place I didn't want to be in. And I love Italy. The people here are fabulous. Country people are always nicer than city people, actually. And they are very, very charming, gentle people here. And I just feel that England has become something I don't like anymore. It's just not the same atmosphere. It's too busy. There's too many cars, too many airplanes. People are unkind. And I don't like the way that immigrants are treated and poor people. It's a crime to be poor now. And I don't like that. I just feel that we've got to be gentler and kinder and more open to people. And um, here in Italy, I experienced that. And in London, I just didn't. I found them, you know, just people were nasty. And a lot of clapping on the screen here. Um, gentleman who said that his family landed in Leith. They were very interested to hear. No, really? Oh, no. And he said his family landed there. He was born there. And was Harry Margolis part of your family? No, he wasn't, unfortunately, because I know that he was a terrific bloke and a, a wonderful musician and band leader. Okay. I, I do know that because occasionally I got letters that were addressed to him. Uh, and I, I got, I got them, so I had to send them off back. Um, but he's not our family. Um, I don't know where his family came from, actually. But ours definitely came from Belarus. Okay. 
So at the moment, I don't know if anyone's got any more questions they want to pop through chat. I'm going to hand back to Agnes because I know she's got a few more questions to ask you, um, but some of those are quite relevant to, to where you were up to. So I'll hand back to Agnes now. And one of the one of the short films uh, I wanted to ask you about was watching Rosie. Yes, that was done this year, and it was done on Zoom, which is the way that we're communicating now. I'd never done a film on Zoom before, but they sent it through to me and and said, "Would I?" And it was for uh, a charity for, um, I think it's called. I can't even remember the name of it now, but it's about um, helping people with dementia. Um, yes, Dementia UK, it's called. And um, this is something that anybody who's had any contact with dementia will know. It's such a difficult illness to deal with and so hard on the family and the people around that I felt I absolutely wanted to. So... It, we did it, we did it incredibly quickly, actually, in just a few days. And I was playing a woman with dementia. And uh, it, I was in my house and my granddaughter was in her house and somebody comes to the door and they really did. And we were able to position the cameras, uh, some of which were just iPhones like the iPhones with cameras, so that we were able to film it. And it seemed remarkably like a film. I mean, it didn't seem as if it was done on Zoom. And um, I, I enjoyed it very much. I, I'm glad I did it and I would do it again. Do you think it will be available again? It's not available to watch at the moment. It will be available again, yes. I think, I mean, the, when we did it, when it was first put out, you had to pay to view because it was to raise money for Dementia UK. But nobody wants to pay for anything these days. It's terrible. Everybody wants something for nothing. And um, that's why charities all over the world, whatever charity, they're desperate for guilt. <laughs> there isn't any. Uh, and that's why we put it, but eventually it will be. But I just hope people be prepared to make donations. I mean, I make donations. They're much less than they used to be because not so much money is coming in. But still, people have got to be generous. Don't they call it Rachmanis? Rachmanis. 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 Yes, yes. So I just got one more question for you. We talked a little bit about the Marigold Hotel. Um, Indian people treat the elderly with great respect. And you also traveled to some other countries on the Marigold tour. Where do you think would be the best way, best place to move to, to retire? Or which, which way would it be best to retire? There's no question that Asian nations treat their elderly better than we do. In the West, we have lost that gift of opening a family, extending the family wider. And in, in every Indian family, the grandmother or grandfather would be there, part of the family, tended to by the family, looked after and safe and loved. It's no accident that in England, the biggest Jewish home in England is Nightingale House. And that is on the far side of South London. Where do all the Jews live in London? They live in North London. Why would they have their homes in South, their parents in South London? Not good, not good. So I think I would, if I had to choose where I would grow old, it would be in one of the Asian nations. For example, in Vietnam, when I was there, I did a, a tour there for Age International. The people in the villages there look after their old people. They don't even have to be in the same family. But there is a rota 
of the village. And if they know that somebody is ill, long term as well, chronic, they look after them. Meals are bought and people are, are washed and dressed and talked to. We are embarrassed by our elderly. And I'm old now and I can see that. We are unwelcome. They want to get rid of us. Well, tough shit, mate, they're not getting rid of us. We're here to stay until it's our time to go. <laughs> Miriam, thank you very much. <laughs> we do respect our, our elderly, but life has changed a lot in this country. Um, anyway, Miriam, all that needs to be left now is for me to say a huge thank you very much on behalf of everybody that was with us today. It was lovely, lovely to, to hear you talk. And as you see, everybody enjoyed it thoroughly and we loved our time with you. And come back again another time and tell us about more of your adventures and a new place. <laughs> well, Agnes, thank you very much. You, you personally have done a difficult job with great grace and charm, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you very <laughs> much, indeed. Lovely thank to see you. Well, and I hope, I, hope all go, I hope all goes well with COVID, and from we'll your mouth to God's ears, yes. Yes, and maybe one day we'll see you in in London or in Glasgow for that matter. You'll certainly see me in Glasgow. Glasgow has a piece of my heart. My father came from Glasgow, I'll never forget that. And my family's there. You know, my, my cousin, uh, Gloria Jacobson is there. And I, I wish I'd thought to tell her that this was going on, but well, I'll get her to watch it on YouTube. But it was a great honor and pleasure for me to talk to everybody today. I wish I could meet all of you individually because you've all got stories. And stories are how we learn. And stories must be kept and, and uh, retrieved for, for later use by younger people. So yes. write down your stories or record them. Make your grandchildren listen so they will know what made them, what what trials you had to go through so that they could live a decent life. Very important. You are all repositories of your own histories and those histories are precious. Thank you for letting me come into your living rooms and I hope I will all meet you one day. I will come to Garnet Hill and do another fundraiser and I will go to whatever what was the name of the something lodge? Was the Glasgow uh, the school? Old, the uh, Alderwood Lodge School? No, the one for older people, old people's. Old people's home. Uh, West Acres Care Home. We got several. You've got several. Well, I love going to care homes. I'll be in one myself soon. So I love going to them and, and talking to people. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for listening. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See you another time.